pray? Dear Jesus, in this darkness, we must look deep to remember your sacrificial love. Your love broke our anger and fear and now shines light into vivid death. Your faithful character bore life from such emptiness. Your kindness created and revealed hope out of devastation. Your truth remained through incrimination and caused relief and freedom in spite of imprisonment. Your dying cry brought us forgiveness instead of punishment. Thank you that we can now walk in the light of your life, hope, truth, freedom, and forgiveness, all available to us this day and every day. It's in your name we pray, dear Jesus, our Savior. Amen. and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. A reading from God's Word, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. This is the word of our Lord.
Our next reading is from Psalm 22. As we look at the words of Psalm 22, it's real easy for us to imagine standing at the foot of the cross and seeing all the agony that Jesus went through, his thirst, his pain, the rejection by the people. But Psalm 22 was penned a thousand years before Jesus' death. King David wrote this psalm and with God's divine intervention wrote down words that described the cross before the cross had even been invented by the Romans. This means that this was God's plan. He had already devised a plan long before King David even to deal with our injustice, our sin. Hear the words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you, are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Stricken smith message tonight is taken from John chapter 19. I'll read these words, I have a short prayer, and then share a message with you. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to, to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven, into one, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said from Psalm 22, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there and they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to see you for who you really are and love you according to the reality of your giving nature. Kill off all untrue images of who we think or imagine you to be. Instead, replace these untruths with truth, truth-bearing images as seen in John 19, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and your entire revealed identity as shown in the Bible, your truth. Be with us by your word. Be with us tonight by your spirit. And may your spirit in our hearts and minds instruct us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in right thinking and living. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is dead. 135 years ago, Friedrich Nietzsche uttered those words, God is dead. And here's the quote that it's all encompassed in. He said, God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world has yet owned, has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? We must ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it, he asks. God is dead. And I agree with Nietzsche. I agree with him, but maybe not in the way that you might think. I agree with Nietzsche because... The death of God is the only answer for the modern predicament, the, the, the modern dilemma of our time, of our culture. The modern dilemma is that the moral leaders, the Western cultural leaders, have looked at this concept of a traditional God and said, surely, with all the, the injustice and the suffering and the pain in our world, God must be dead. Because the traditional God... Not the God of the Bible, but the, the God of traditional religions is the God who looks at all who do good and he rewards those who do good with a good life. He makes them prosperous. He weaves into their life. If they do good things, he weaves goodness into their life. 
But if they are immoral, if they do evil, if they're bent on hurting others and lying and deceiving, then that God weaves in destruction and pain and hurt into their lives. And yet because of five names in our 20th century history, five names, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, and Mussolini, just those five names alone and all the atrocities and the injustice they brought in show us that the God of traditional culture must be dead. Why? Because if, if that's the God who rewards good and rewards good people, how many good people suffered in the Holocaust? How many good people went to the gas chambers? We can look at the list and, and see that there are a lot of good people who died in injustice. And the evil ones seem to thrive. Even today in our 21st century, we look at injustice and think, this is not right. For two reasons, God appears aloof, but also that idea of salvation through works that if I'm good enough, I attain justice. All kinds of wonderful people died under the injustice of the Nazi regime, the Khmer Rouge, the killing fields. That God must be dead. And all modern philosophers and skeptics said, God has died. But Friedrich Nietzsche, still believing that that type of God is dead, Friedrich Nietzsche said, there's still a problem, though, something he called the last man. And in a number of his writings, he wrote about the last man. The last man would hold out for the difference between justice and injustice. And even though this last man believed that God is dead, he still believed we must fight for morality and push down immorality. We must live for the good and deny the bad. And Nietzsche said, Wake up. If God is dead, you have no basis for right or wrong. If God is truly dead, you have no foundation. And yet our modern and postmodern world today is filled with all kinds of last men and women who say we must strive for the good and avoid what is bad. How do we determine what is good and what is evil if God has truly died? Interestingly enough, years before Nietzsche, years before the modern philosophers, the gospel accounts came in and said, yes, God must die. God must die because of the pain and the injustice and the suffering in our world. The gospel even considered the death of God as something legitimate in order to deal with the suffering and injustice of this world. God planned it. And in post-World War II, after the Holocaust, after the ungodly things happened, and all of Germany was just starting to wake up to the Nazism and its atrocities and the Holocaust and the death chambers and the gassings. In Germany, many people were starting to waken up to this idea that we are guilty, but they would point fingers and say, did you know about this? Did you know about the evil? Did you know what they were doing? Did you know that they took good people and, and murdered them? And a man named Gunther Rudeborn, Gunther Rudeborn wrote a play called The Sign of Jonah. And in this play, he developed a concept much like what was happening in the real Germany. And in this play, everyone was looking at everyone else and said, did you know? Did you see this? And people would say, I, I had no idea. I was just following orders. And they would point to the person above them. 
And they go to the person above them in the play and in real life, and they said, did you know? I was just following orders. I was just doing what I was told. Go to the man above me. And in the play, eventually, someone gets the notion. It's not just the person above them. It's not just the leader of our country. It's the guy way at the top. He's responsible. And in the play, they put God on trial. They put God on the defendant's stand. And they said, God must pay. And here's the sentence they pronounced on him. We sentence God to become a human being, a wanderer on the earth, deprived of rights, homeless, hungry, thirsty. He himself shall die and then lose his son and suffer the injustice of it and suffer the agonies of fatherhood. And in the end, when he dies, he shall be disgraced and ridiculed. God must die. One minister who read through this play and experienced this play said, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. They're looking for God to die for the injustice of this world? But God, the God of the Bible, the God of the Gospels, John 19, the perfect God of righteousness has done even more than our blasphemous and our cursing minds has dared to demand. The God of the Bible, the God of John 19, God himself planned his own death in order to undo all pain all injustice, all suffering, to face it, to pay for it, to reverse it, and in the end, to die. You see, God really did die for the injustice, the hurt that's been inflicted on you. And God did die for the injustice and the hurt and the pain caused by me and you. God died a horrible, forsaken death because this world is full of pain. God died a horrible and forsaken death because I have put some of that pain in this world and so have you. God died because there have been times when I've been uncaring. God died because I have not loved as he instructed me to love. God died, limbs twisted and torn and skin ripped from his back because sin distorts and tears and demoralizes and lies and jeers and taunts all kinds of victims. And we should have died. And God said, for this and so much more, I choose to die. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Isaiah 53 says, surely he took up our pain Surely he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there and they soaked a sponge and put it, the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, the cleansing plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. God bowed his divine head and gave up his perfect spirit so that we could go free. So that we could live forever. So that we would be healed.
pray. Lord Jesus, you did die. God was dead. And yet we know throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you, you could not die without taking care of every one of our sins, and you did. They're gone. You've been paid for at the cross. Our, our names have been nailed to the cross along with all of our sins. And we are so thankful for that. Lord, at times when we demand justice for the hurt that's been inflicted on us, turn our minds and our, our hearts away from that and, and help us to see the injustice that has been done to us has already been dealt with at the cross and we can forgive. We can turn our hearts away from demanding revenge because it's been taken out on you already. Heavenly Father, turn our hearts and minds to good knowing that all has been erased and we are set free. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Two last instructions in this service. The first is that the offering plate will be coming around, and this is for members only. I know a number of you are guests here tonight. Please do not feel obligated to, to give. Uh, our, our membership here is our reason to give. The second instruction is that you were handed a, a small little card on the way in. And I would ask that you please put your name on this card, and I'll give you further instructions after the offering. Thank you.
at this portion of the service, we have the grand opportunity to see what the real cost of our sin is. And that is our names get nailed to the cross. So I'm going to ask you, take that piece of paper with your name on it tonight. And my family's going to start out first, if you would please come up, Shanda and kids. And as the ushers instruct you, please follow with your name. Come to the cross, grab a hammer, grab a nail. Nail your name to the cross. But in that moment, I want you to think, not only is this the place where everything is paid for, but in that moment, Jesus has taken everything off of your shoulders and put it on his own. You go free. You go free. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. The wages of sin is death. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. The wages of sin is death. Sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The wages of sin is death. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. 
wages of sin is death. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. The wages of sin is death. rejected us, God, and you have burst upon us. You have been angry, now restore us. The wages of sin is death. You have shaken the land and torn it open. Mend its fractures, for it is quaking. You have shown your people desperate times. You have given us wine that makes us stagger. The wages of sin is death. But for those who fear you, you have raised a banner. The wages of sin is death, a banner to be unfurled against the bow. Save us and help us with your right hand. Save us and help us that those you love may be delivered. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. The wages of my sin is death. my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Come now, let us settle the matter together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Wages of sin is death. The wages.
wages of sin is death. Jesus' final words. It is finished.